I was just reading a book called What Do We Owe the Future by moral philosopher William McCaskill. In it, he notes that for thousands of years, slavery existed in learned societies, and no philosophers or thinkers really gave a second thought to that institution. It was just the way the world worked. It wasn't until some radical thinkers, really only a few hundred years ago, uh, became along and began to think that the institution of slavery might be immoral. Now, I won't go into detail about why McCaskill is concerned with this, but I will bring it up to a large degree because the Western world, as well as just worldwide, are male-dominated or were male-dominated societies without any real consideration given to women. Just as with slavery, no one gave consideration to the fact that it might be immoral for a social structure to have women not be equal to men. Women were simply expected to attend to domestic issues. Women couldn't own property. Women couldn't inherit property. Women couldn't work. Women were not allowed to become uh, the queen of the monarch unless there was no suitable male heir. It was maybe out of necessity because the king didn't have one, etc. The lack of consideration for women really didn't come into play until what we considered the first wave of feminism in the mid-1800s. There was a lack of awareness that women's rights were, uh, uh, there was a lack of awareness uh, for women's rights, just as there was a lack of awareness for slavery as an immoral state for a long time in our intellectual history. So the first wave of feminism comes along and it took on really issues of inheritance, education, suffrage, the rights of women to work outside the home. You can see this movement in the late 1800s. I believe there's some indications that there's a publication of a book in 1848 that maybe is seen as the hallmark, uh, but it's also in the early 1900s. You see the women's right to vote. You see women burning bras. You see women beginning to work outside the homes in some ways, women beginning to get educations, women's colleges forming. And this is all the result of that first wave of feminism, the idea that women can be educated, can vote, can participate in society in some basic level. Now, that's all fine and good up until about the 1960s when the second wave of feminism comes along. It's more focused on the fact that women maybe get an education, they begin to participate somewhat in the social life, but they're kind of like a lot of them, when they get a little bit older, they get married, they go join a home and they basically become wives. And so at least in uh, upper middle class uh, white society, that's the case, which is a criticism that's been given against the second wave. Well, suddenly they realize that if they're going to really use these, they need to be able to participate and so there begins to become a focus on reproductive rights, domestic and sexual violence against women, the fact they may not feel safe in the workplace or out in public, paid maternity leave, equal pay in the workplace. There was a sense that women could get an education, they could vote, but they were mostly relegated to home life. By controlling reproduction through birth control or abortion, by taking on violence against women, sexual harassment in the workplace, by taking on limiting factors such as maternity leave that they couldn't take because they weren't paid, so they would just quit, or they weren't allowed maternity leave in the first place. Uh, women were able to move further into the workplace to have roles that allowed them to stay in the workplace and allowed them to be actual workers in the long term. That all was around the 1960s, so that's not that long ago. And then finally, a third wave of feminism comes along that creates what we call the feminist ethics of care uh, or ethics of care. It began in the 1980s or 1990s. Uh, and it was, it, was, uh, it, be, it was a time when people began to think, uh, it began to think that the way people view the world and ethics is dominated by white males and that we should have an ethical system that perhaps takes the point of view, the perspective of women into account. Now, let's take a moment, just for a second, to think about all the people we've studied so far this semester, or the theories. We've studied Immanuel Kant, John Stuart Mill. Now, John Stuart Mill was in that first wave of feminist thinkers, feminist writers. He was an advocate for that position. 
Jeremy Bentham, Ron Dworkin, John Rawls, Aristotle, Plato, St. Thomas Aquinas. All those people I've named are European white males. When Kant talks about a universal morality, the feminists of the third wave begin to think that it is really just a universal for white males. What's universal among white males is what universal means. It's not universal to all people. It is something that only white males come up. Whereas white males, of course, don't think that this is a universal specific to them. So what it's really, they're saying is they're just their perspective. Not that, uh, that, that women oftentimes approach the world very differently. So this third wave recognizes that it is dominated by white Europeans, not just about being male, it's also about being white and European. And the third wave tries to take other voices and see how they approach morality. It tries to look at the voices of other minority groups. Now, my, before I go into more about the theories of care ethics, I probably should take a minute to talk about feminism and a few general bookkeeping things. In modern American society, a lot of people consider themselves feminists or don't like to consider themselves a feminist because there's a certain stigma that's attached to that term. When I say, are you a feminist? People are like, I don't know if I'm a feminist. I don't, I don't know about that. Now, there's something that's kind of sinister about that. And part of this comes from the fact that I think that there's been a push by maybe more conservative talk radio and other things to villainize uh, feminism. Rush Limbaugh used to, he, was a, he died a few years ago. He was a very uh, well-known uh, conservative talk show, uh, radio talk show host. And he used to like to refer to them as feminazis. Uh, so he liked to call them Nazis. It was some sort of sense that feminism was some sort of radical agenda to destroy men, to relegate them from society and, you know, impose some sort of, uh, I don't know, matriarchy or something. And there is this idea, though, that feminism is something more than kind of the classical concept of feminism. The classical concept of feminism is just that women should be given the same opportunities as men in work and life, that they should not be limited in their opportunities for jobs, forced to be mothers, or forced to stay at home if they don't want to. And at the end of the day, I think most people probably agree with that. Most of you are probably saying, yeah, I think women should be afforded equal opportunities, should be able to do the same thing that they can, that those opportunities should be there. And that's really all we're talking about. It's a view that women should be given the oppor same opportunities as men. Now, when we talk about ethics, we're talking about the idea that women's perspective on moral issues should be seen the same and not just relegated or not looked at. Now, let's talk about some of the statements that get made in feminist ethics. Traditionally, women have been caregivers. Uh, this was because women were essentially left to work out of the home. They took care of the kids, they took care of their spouse, they took care of the home, they provided care. And this is why the term care ethics or ethics of care get applied to what we oftentimes call feminist ethics. There is uh, there is some question about whether or not women are naturally inclined to be caring or if they simply have become caring because it's the only option that was afforded them. Uh, there is some debate on that issue and it can't really be uh, completely determined. There was a 2006 survey that tried to answer this question in Sorry, in which, uh, in which there was a psychological experiment in which researchers looked to see if women were more empathetic than men. They did a test where a man or woman said something shocking. Uh, and they found that if a man said something shocking, that there was a certain point in the man's brain, a reward centers, the parts that we see as connected to rewards, was activated when they saw the shock or they got some sort of shock reaction from the person. This might explain why men often kind of rib each other, uh, that it's common that they insult one another in normal male-to-male -male interplay. Uh, they take some reward in trying to one-up one another. That's kind of common among men <clears throat> that they engage in this kind of behavior. Women, on the other hand, when they did said something and they saw that it caused a shock reaction, it actually activated pain centers in their brains. 
And what that suggests is that they didn't take delight or enjoy it. And so they maybe felt some sort of empathy toward those who were shocked, suggesting that perhaps women's brains are wired to be empathetic, to feel for the other person more than the male brain is. I will just give a quick example because this happened just this afternoon. I was walking down the hall and I saw a picture from uh, an art class of a, uh, they do nude drawing and there was a picture and it just caught me out of the corner of my eye. I didn't realize it was a nude drawing, but it looked kind of like my wife's brother in the face. And then I looked at it a little closer and realized it was from the nude drawing class. It was just as bad. Um, and I took a picture. I said to my wife, I said, it kind of looks like your brother. And to which she responded, thanks. Now I can't get that idea out of my head. Now it's not her brother. And I, there were some other pictures. It looks nothing really like it other than that one just happened to have a sort of profile resemblance to it. Now, for me, I kind of was amused by it, uh, that, you know, you know, that I was kind of uh, doing that. She, on the other hand, typically does not find that really funny. She's like, why are you teasing me? Like, you know, why are you doing this? And so there's a little bit of, there's clearly, you know, we respond differently. Now, the problem is, is we might conclude that women, because of this way of reacting, are wired to be more empathetic. That's possible, but it's also possible that women are trained to feel bad if they offend someone. You can't say that women are naturally more empathetic or that is the result, or you can't say that it's possibly just the result of society teaching girls that they should feel bad for engaging in this kind of interplay that's you know, perhaps what men oftentimes engage in. They are socially taught that they are not supposed to engage in that, and men are taught that they should engage in that type of behavior. However, we won't try to escape some nature versus nature debate here. We aren't going to try to resolve that. We simply take that some of the way women understand and appreciate the world, no matter the cause, whether it's nature or nurture, is a different way of viewing it from what males have viewed the world. And males who dominate ethical analysis take that view and they approach it in that way. With that said, I also want to make a quick note that there's a little bit of a sense that now if I'm asserting women are more caring, that they're more empathetic, that I'm now making a statement about all women, when in fact I'm making a general statement about a large number of women, or most women. And it basically suggests, care ethics suggests women in general are more likely to be empathetic, they're more likely to be nurturers, they're more likely to be caring. Now you should note this is not true of all women. I will also argue that every woman, even the most selfless, caring, uh, a caring woman that anybody could ever think of, has periods where she feels no need to nurture or care for anybody. And so you can't suggest that you know any woman is always in an instance interested in caring or nurturing or looking out after others. They don't. And not all women are even wired that way more than men. So these are just some generalizations in some ways. It is not uh, some hard and fast rule about women. So it's something we should kind of just make clear that, you know, when I'm talking in these generalizations, you know, it could be perhaps negative, And that is a criticism that sometimes gets leveled against this theory that it, you know, kind of overlooks or suggests that all women are a certain way. And that's unfair. Now, the basic assertion of the third wave of feminism is that male-dominated concepts of ethics tend to focus on kind of four categories. They focus on rules, they focus on rights, they focus on the universalizability of ethical claims, and they focus on impartiality. Now, all of you should probably recognize that, you know, we've just been doing a lot this semester and we've used all those concepts quite a bit. Rights, rules, universal, impartial. These are all concepts, though, that are born uh, out of an idea that of kind of maleness is what feminist ethics suggests. Men, by and large, are encouraged to leave the house, go out and get a job in the world. Uh, they aren't expected to stay home with their kids. They're not supposed to take care of people. They're supposed to go out there, be their own autonomous selves, meaning they make their own decisions and control their world, and they must provide and act in a larger 
world. So Alison Jagger comes along and she says, women, on the other hand, were predominantly relegated to the home. Uh, they dealt with home life, they dealt with relationships, they dealt with caring for their children, caring for their spouse, caring for the home, caring for family, and perhaps aging relatives, sick individuals. And they tend to produce, they tend to focus on ethics instead of from the perspective of rural rights and universalizability and impartiality, they tend to look at relationships because caring is about relationships. They tend to focus on their responsibilities versus their rights because responsibilities are what people who care for others have to meet. They have responsibilities to uphold. They're interested in particularities. How do I handle this situation rather than how do I create rules that everybody has to follow? And they're also not impartial, they tend to be partial. So let's look at all these side by sin, side. Men are about rules, is kind of the first assertion. When you're out in the world, you need to have rules to follow. But when you're dealing with people in a home, you can't always have a rigid set of rules on how to do things. People have different needs. Sometimes people, uh, you know, sometimes if one kid needs one thing, sometimes one kid's particularly sick. And so the idea is you have to deal with them on a relational method. As an example of this, uh, I remember one time uh, watching somebody, they were giving kind of marriage advice and it was saying, you know, married couples need to remember that marriage is not a 50-50 venture. People always say, you know, marriage is 50-50. And they say, no, it's not 50-50. Sometimes you're gonna give 100% while your spouse does nothing. There are gonna be things you care about where you're gonna give 80% and your spouse is gonna give 20% and that's gonna be okay. Because there's gonna be other days where it's the opposite. If you expect it to always be an equal burden, then you're going to approach it from a wrong lens and you're going to be disappointed. Well, this is just some general advice to get people to realize that you can't expect your spouse to share every burden equally. It is also an awareness that relationships are not rigidly rule-driven devices, that, that relationships are fluid, they're organic. Sometimes you give more, sometimes you give less. There are no strict rules. And this leads feminism to focus on relationships versus rules. The next is rights versus responsibilities. Now, for caregivers, there's a strong focus on responsibilities. If you don't meet your responsibilities, those in your charge suffer. If one, uh, uh, one as a caregiver doesn't typically get bogged down on what are my rights? What do I have a right to do in this situation? That's the domain really more of men who are out in the world demanding a certain respect for their autonomy and their place and responsibility is the dominant feature for those engaging in caregiving. Universalizability versus particularity. So universals versus looking at particular situations. In the male dominated world in which one is out in the world leading their own autonomous life, you want rules that apply everywhere, okay? You want rules that are universal. You know what the rules are, you know what to expect. But when you're in a caring relationship, the rules change for the situation at hand. I'll give you an example, like uh, with my ex-wife, now we were divorced, so maybe she was just looking for things to complain about, but uh, I remember my ex-wife one time being annoyed that I treated our younger son, who's about 18 months younger than our older son, uh, differently. And I told her at one point, like, he's two years old, his brother's almost four, you know, the four-year-old doesn't need help getting his jacket on, but the other one does. The one can walk up the stairs fairly easily, but the other one, it's just easier if I carry him. I'm not coddling him. I'm not doing it. I'm just recognizing that they each have different needs. I can't universalize the care for the children when they are different and they have different needs. And so there's a particularity that exists in care based upon the need of the individual in that situation. And finally, we get to impartiality versus impartiality. Now this to a large degree, I think one of the things the book talks about as well as <coughs> one of the kind of keys to feminist ethics is they take a little bit of an issue with John Rawls. Uh, John Rawls, as you remember, has this veil of ignorance where you're supposed to forget any role you might have in the future uh, and, you know, and set a society that, that allows for everybody and the feminists just kind of take great umbrage to this claim that a person must approach the, this with impartiality. 
you know, as a, as a caregiver, you have a primary duty to care for your children and your family, not to care for others. You can't create a society where somehow you owe more to a person on the other side of the world versus your own child or your own family. You know, if you have limited resources, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, thinking, oh, well, you know, my kid, you know, shouldn't go to the circus or shouldn't be given a lollipop because I could use that money to send overseas and help children who have nothing, right? And my kid uh, does not take any special consideration in how I spend my money, how I spend my efforts, how I spend my talents. And as a result, if you do that, that that's a problem for those children. So for those of you maybe who read Peter Singer's article on famine and world poverty, you might see how utilitarians demand that we somehow forget our relationships and obligations, that you can't, you, you can't really be impartial to the home or when taking care and protecting a family. Partiality is part of that role. To fight like a bear for those you're caring for is to be partial to them. That you don't just say, ah, I'll give it up the same fight for those that I'm put in charge of, those that are my children, those that are my spouse, those that are my family, and treat them the same. No, that is the act of a caregiver to provide impartial response. And that is an ethic or value uh, that we greatly prize in caregivers. And so we shouldn't really forget about that. So let's turn to uh, the, the, the thinker, Carol uh, Gilligan. Uh, she talked about this approach to ethics from the perspective of relationships versus justice and rights. She asserted that women go through three stages to develop, uh, to develop kind of their, their, their perspective, their approach to care. She says everybody starts kind of, all women start like in a self-centeredness stage where it's essentially you worry about yourself as a way to ensure survival. It's very one self-focus. Then you go through a transitional stage. This is a stage where you begin to realize that there are others, that they, you need to provide care for these others, that you can't really be selfish. This is a period of trying to balance oneself with the care of others. It's kind of realizing I need to provide some sort of care for others and taking that into account. And finally, there is the critical stage or phase, the third stage. And this is where the connection between oneself and others leads to a concept of responsibility to others and oneself. There's not a complete abandonment of concern for oneself, but there's at least this kind of more developed, more critical awareness that you have to provide care that is also not just about yourself, but for others. <clears throat> Perhaps one could also talk about the idea of maternal morality, the idea that one acts as a mother in caring for depending uh, children, dependent children. It's this idea that, you know, there's just this morality that comes that when you're a mother or when you're a parent, I don't even know if it has to be a mother, that you, uh, but it's feminist ethics, so it uses maternal language, that if you are a mother, that you have a moral obligation, a moral call, a moral duty to take care of your children. Now, Nell Noddings uh, creates an idea that there is kind of this pre-ethical level of care that occurs for mothers and parents that's just kind of this natural care. It's not ethical. It's not, it's kind of pre-ethical. It's just our nature. It's our instinct. It's the idea that you have this natural instinct to protect and care for your young as an instinct. Instincts aren't moral or immoral. They're just what you do. I can give you an example that kind of a natural pre-ethical, just, uh, just, a, you know, kind of a maternal or a pater parental moral kind of call this natural care that's within me is, you know, if my child falls and starts to cry, if my kid gets up in the middle of the night, fussy, uh, my kid has a fever, throws up, I'll drop everything and run over to comfort my child. I may feel overwhelmed with some primal need to act, to comfort, to protect, to help, to ease the pain. I'm not making a conscious choice. I'm just acting out of a natural inclination to care for that child. But what Noddings does is Nodding says, maybe not everybody has a natural inclination. It'd be best if all of our care was born out of a natural inclination. But she suggests that there is a form of ethical care, an ethical dimension to care. And it is one that is more intentional. It's born from the idea that someone else 
besides you has needs. Second of all, you recognize that you can provide for that need that the other person can't provide for themselves. Okay, so somebody needs something, you have the ability to help them with that need. This can be uh, a child, a sick family member, a patient if you work in a hospital, a friend who's having a hard time, whatever it be. They have a problem, they need you to listen, they need your help, they need your advice, they need your help, and you have the ability to help them. And you begin to realize that because this person has a need and you have the ability to meet that need, you begin to make a moral claim on you that you should work to fulfill that need. And so in that regard, she explains how care can be a moral claim on a person, how it can make a moral claim for us to help somebody. Now, I can talk a little bit about this maybe uh, that's not necessarily just a natural care, but an ethical care might be, if I talk about my sons again, uh, I may not uh, like be like, you know, like I don't have this natural, like I have to go play games and read books and interact with them, etc. out of a sense of instinct. I like doing it. I mean, there is a naturalness to that, but I also make it an intentional effort to realize that my children need to engage in, <coughs> in intellectual developments. They need to play with their father. They need to test their mind. They need to learn proper ways to care, proper ways to interact with their family, proper ways to care for kids. They need to learn all this. They need to see some, that kind of behavior model. And so it, is not, it was not unusual when my sons were younger for, uh, to, to want to engage in these activities out of a sense that they need that and I can provide it. And so it's making a moral claim on me that I should do it. it I would oftentimes take my children to the museum or on nature work or spend a day working on a, a, a art project. And then I would just work later in the evening while my uh, ex-wife would have my children in the evening. Or now that I'm married, we have a young son, you know, maybe I would do that. And then she would take care of bath or have a mom's day later with our son uh, on the weekend. And because I saw, I see a moral claim on me that I should provide these types of things for my kid. And so this is where... It's not necessarily born out of instinct, it's born out of ethics. That there is a moral calling to care, that there is a moral dimension and why we have this moral imperative to care is this is kind of nodding explains that need to us. Now, I'm giving myself examples as a father or a male doing these things, but this is feminist ethics. And one of the criticisms of care ethics is that it makes women's ethics different by emphasizing their care perspective. It's kind of, it is feminist and it tends to look at women and why they care and why they do stuff as mothers. And part of that raises the criticism that care ethics is making, you know, because women are inclined towards this, that it's an essential part of being a woman and kind of forces them back into the role of caregivers. And so one of the criticisms that is of some significance <clears throat> is if you say women are really good at caring or more caring than men, then women should go do what they're good at and they should stay home. And that, that's kind of one of the criticisms is, is this in fact taking something that's supposed to be liberating, encouraging women to get out work and to self-actualize and to let their values be played out in moral analysis and instead taking that and forcing them back into some sort of role in uh, domestic things. Uh, so a uh, thinker, and, and Ferguson suggested that women are expected to provide four goods in the house. She's a bit of a, um, a communist or socialist, I guess I'd say socialist thinker. And she says, women are expected to provide four goods to house. They produce children, right? They give birth. They maintain the house. They do household maintenance. They clean, they cook, etc. They care for their children and their spouse and they provide sex. So she sees women as doing those things, but oftentimes they're kind of like exploited workers. This is so capitalist societies, force workers, give them no options. They can't do anything other than work this job at crummy wages and without much choice or without much autonomy. That is kind of the way she views capitalist societies. She says women are put in that same situation. Now, workers can be liberated by having a greater say in their role in the household, by having an option to not be a part of the household, 
And so by making women equal, having opportunities outside of caregiving, you ultimately can overcome this exploitive dynamic and that's where the issue lies. Um, are we enforcing this exploitation or by these theories or are we simply noting a common difference that is overlooked by males? Women oftentimes are more caring and so we're noting that but we're not necessarily saying women should do that. It seems that we are overlooking a female perspective of care, oftentimes happens, but we don't want to emphasize the female perspective in a way that forces women's continue in that role without choice. So a lot of feminism does not emphasize the need to give women the ability to choose, does emphasize the need to get women to choose their role. Now, all that to say, let's turn to an example of how this perspective might be different uh, from typical male analysis of a moral problem. Psychologist Carol Gilligan examined the work of one of her male contemporaries uh, who died in the 80s and she wrote about it in a 1982 book called In a Different Voice. It was about psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg in which uh, he does an experiment in which he kind of comes to a conclusion that women somehow are not as psychologically developed towards moral thinking because of the way they approach moral problems. And she goes, no, hold on. That is a male dominated perspective that isn't taking into account ethics of care. And so what Kohlberg does, let's just talk about Kohlberg's example. Now Kohlberg uses uh, kind of a class example, it's called the Heinz Dilemma. <coughs> and what Kohlberg did is he asked two 11 year old children, a boy named Jake and a girl named Amy, how they would handle this thing called the Heinz Dilemma. Now Heinz, just like the ketchup, is named because there's a man named Heinz, not because it's about ketchup. Now what happens is, the Heinz Dilemma is a case where a man named Heinz has a wife who is dying. Doctors believe that there is one drug that might save her life. It has a very good shot at saving her life, but it's very expensive and the time is ticking on the effectiveness for its use. Now let's say this drug is very expensive. There is no social network to provide it. There's no insurance. This is kind of a, a medieval society and the only option is to get the money together. Let's say it costs like $50,000 just to give it an American concept. I mean, that's a lot of money for any of us to just kind of have, or especially anybody who's working uh, working class or isn't, you know, wealthy. Um, but I think in the example, it's like $2,000, but you know, we'll just say like $50,000. Okay. Let's give us something maybe that maybe has more, uh, that sounds more like something we'd relate to. So the raw material to make this medication costs like $5,000. It's not $50,000, but the person sells it for $50,000 or will only sell it for $50,000 because that allows the person to have profit, it pays for their work, and, and they're entitled. If they have a medication, they can save lives. I mean, they're entitled to make a profit off of that. I would, I would not begrudge somebody that. So Heinz, knowing that it's very expensive, doesn't have the money, he goes out and he begs all of his friends for money. Family, everybody he can come to. Everybody's not the wealthiest, they don't have a ton of money, but they try to help him as much as they can. And at best, they come up with $25,000. So he goes to this druggist, the creator of this medicine, and he says, hey, I got $25,000. Can I buy the medicine? And the druggist says, no, I created this medicine. I'm entitled to make a profit off of it. If I sell it for less than what I think it's worth, I won't make the money that I think that I should have a right to make. So I must insist on that $50,000 price tag. However, Heinz is in a difficult situation because he only has a few days before really this medication has no value to him. There's no way he's going to come up with another $25,000 by the end of the weekend. And so he, uh, he, he's really left with very little choice. He realizes that the druggist laboratory where he keeps this medicine would be fairly easy to break into and steal. He could administer to his wife well before he would be discovered. And so he thinks maybe I should just break in and steal it. What would you do is what he asked. So he asked the boy and the girl, the, he asked Jake and Amy what they should do. They're both 11. Um, and so Jake is just adamant. He's got to steal it. It's the right thing to do. Uh, he tried to buy it at a price that was going to give the druggist a significant profit. Maybe not the profit he wanted. His life, wife's life is at stake. The end is just to my the means. Hines should simply steal it. 
He's resolute in this decision. It's, it's not the wrong thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's a just thing to do. It's unjust for this guy to let somebody die simply because you can't afford the medicine at this moment. Amy, on the other hand, like most of the women in the experiment, kind of are uncertain. They're not as resolute and matter of fact. It's a male versus female perspective, Kohlberg thinks, as well as Gilligan. And she really didn't think that he should steal it. She suggests maybe, maybe instead of stealing it, like, you know, maybe I, can I, can I suggest instead of stealing it that he go back to the druggist and ask him to take the $25,000 and agree that he'll pay him the other $25,000 in increments over the next couple of years until he finally pays off this debt. He says, if Heinzen goes and steals the drug and gets caught, then Heinz is going to go to jail and there's going to be no one there to care for his wife who's dying. He'll be in jail and his wife will die alone. And he has sort of this need to take care of her. Well, what Kohlberg concludes from this is that Jake understood this question and gave a response that's fitting for moral development in the idea that rules are meant to be broken and it's a higher level of moral development and he suggests Amy just doesn't understand the moral significance of this problem and why she should be allowed to steal. Now, there's a little bit of a whole thing about, you know, uh, that I, I always find with psychology. Oftentimes, psychologists like to make these grand assumptions about what your actions mean, even though they have no basis other than just their own interpretation. But that's a whole other issue. And so she tries to find another option that's feasible. But in Kohlberg's mind, she's just not understanding the question. So the care ethicist, Gilligan, comes along and she says, no, Amy understood this just fine. Jace was concerned with rights and justice, according to Gilligan. He didn't see a druggist's right to that profit as outweighing the justice of the situation. He saw the druggist's right to that profit as he didn't see it outweighing the need for justice of the situation. So for him, it's a rights and justice issue. The rights of the druggist to make money, the rights of the dying, and what is really the most just outcome. Amy, on the other hand, was worried about caring for a dying wife. She's worried about relationships. Amy may not have answered the question, but she definitely understood it, according to Gillian. She simply placed care as superior to any concerns about justice that Jake is using in his analysis. And so that's kind of where the ethics of care comes along. Is it suggesting that for a long time, in the classical view, of, uh, that, that, uh, that women don't understand these issues, it's not that they don't understand it, it's that they don't approach it in the same way that the male-dominated European white male perspective has understood these issues. But this isn't the case. Um, Women are just simply using a different perspective and a different way of analyzing the situation. It is common from feminist ethics to appeal to care for others as the basis of morality. And care ethics tries to bring in different voices and ways of approaching problems without simply assuming that they are wrong because they are not steeped in male-focused aspects of morality, which are rights, rules, universalizability, and impartiality. Instead, we can judge issues from the perspective of relationships, responsibilities, particularization, and partiality. For the feminist ethicist, relationships are key. We cannot forget about what role we play and what we are uh, needing in those relationships. It should be noted that feminist ethics, while at first concerned mainly with care, they have also gotten and gone beyond that to begin to seek out perspectives that are not just feminine or about care, but they're about considering the values of people from various cultural, social, economic, racial backgrounds. It's an awareness that a lot of ethics have been white European, male dominated, and have always come from that perspective. And those theories fail to think that there could be another lens through which to see these situations. As a final note, I mean, I gave these examples, but in these kind of traditional concepts and ones you've read about, the idea is that men 
think that, you know, you shouldn't worry about your relationships. You should be completely impartial, completely universal. You know, if somebody's suffering in a third world country, you're as equally obligated to help them as you are your own child, your own self, your own future. And the ethics of care come along and say, no, we should have special regard. We cannot overlook that we don't see these things as somehow unimportant. These relationships are important. And we oftentimes work and create morality. We have a moral claim to help those around us out of a sense of they need our assistance and we can provide it. So we will provide it. And that moral claim takes great level of, of, of necessity on the part of individuals to provide that.